As you just saw in the NBC News special report, today the body cam video was released showing the deadly beating of Tyree Nichols by police in Memphis, Tennessee. And we begin with that story tonight at 5. A 29-year-old died three days after a traffic stop by police earlier this month. Five officers were involved and they have now been charged with murder. Now, earlier tonight, Memphis police, as you just saw, released video of some of what happened that night. And we are about to show you a small portion of that video. We do want to warn you, it is graphic and some viewers may find it very difficult to watch. There's an hour in total. Most of it is from body cameras, but we'll show you a view from a police camera mounted nearby, and there is no audio on this clip. Yeah, Laurel and I have had a chance to review some of this over the last hour, so we're going to provide some context here. This clip starts after officers have brought Nichols to the ground. The video here appears to show one officer kick Nichols, another repeatedly punches him, a third hits him with a baton. Now some of those blows hit Nichols in the head. There's also a portion where Nichols appears to be unable to stand up. At other times, officers use a taser and pepper spray. Now this is the clip we've had time to take a close look at so far. We're also looking at how long he was on the ground before Nichols got any medical attention. There is more video available from multiple body camps here. The release of the video is expected to spark protests and demonstrations across the country tonight. It already has in Memphis this evening. The family of Tyree Nichols and Memphis police are all urging for calm and peace. Here in Portland, Mayor Ted Wheeler and Police Chief Chuck Lavelle held a news conference about an hour ago echoing that sentiment. Let me be clear. The behavior of those officers is unacceptable anywhere. Those officers failed to protect their community and they failed to uphold their sworn off their sworn oath to serve the community with integrity. I support those who wish to exercise their right to be heard and I understand their deep concerns. I also want to echo the request of Tyree Nichols family and urge the community to do so peacefully in a nonviolent manner. I want to be clear, this tragedy cannot be used as an invitation to cause destruction and harm to our community or the people who live here. Well, PPB Chief Chuck Lavelle echoing the mayor there, calling the actions of the police officers in Memphis shocking and unconscionable, but also calling for peace. Now, some businesses downtown have boarded up windows today in anticipation of any unrest. Of course, much more coverage on developments surrounding Tyree Nichols coming up on NBC Nightly News at 530 and, of course, later in on KGW News. In other news tonight, we have an update. Hundreds of Portland city workers plan to strike starting next week. The city of Portland now says it is prepared to hire replacement workers and reassign employees to cover workforce gaps. Our Evan Watson looks into why there is still no signed contract after months of negotiations. The city of Portland and the laborers union can't agree on cost of living increases and raises. More than 600 workers plan to strike. These are mostly sewer and wastewater workers, street maintenance workers, pollution testers, and park rangers. I think it's going to be a huge challenge for the city to find people that can replicate the work our folks do. James O'Loughlin is a former wastewater operator who's now working as a Portland City Laborers Union rep. He says about 630 specialized trade workers are ready to strike starting on Thursday. And if that happens, the community will notice. Things break. All the catastrophic failures that we face routinely that get addressed, they're not going to be addressed. They're not going to be fixed. Sewer lines, pump stations, uh, city infrastructure, crises in the parks, all those things that the public doesn't see because our people handle it, they're going to see. Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler has issued an emergency declaration in preparation for the planned strike saying the city will hire replacement workers and contractors with emergency funds to ensure the work continues. The city and the union are at an impasse over pay, specifically cost of living increases and raises that reflect rising inflation. Portland says it's offering a 12% wage increase to these workers by July, with half of that retroactive to 2022. This includes a 5% cost of living increase for each year. The workers in the union, however, want the city to remove the cap of 5% for cost of living increases, both now and into the future. O'Loughlin points to Bureau of Labor Statistics data 
that shows inflation rose between 6 and 8 percent the last two years. We can't have our people take pay cuts based on inflation after the way they showed up for the city through the pandemic and its related crises. They're, they're just not going to do it. We're going to lose people, you know, at a rate that exceeds the challenges with vacancies, recruitment and retention the city's already faced. The city and union reps were in negotiation sessions on Friday. The city says it's also offering health care improvements, increased hours for seasonal workers and other concessions. But for now, both sides say they're planning for a strike. The union and workers are holding a rally tomorrow right here from noon to three in front of City Hall. They say they're committed to negotiating a fair contract. City leaders aren't taking interviews on this topic right now, just preparing for those workforce replacements. Evan Watson, KGW News. Okay, we got to talk about weather. Let's take a live look outside now from our downtown Portland Wells Fargo sky camera. Dry out there right now, relatively warm compared to what's coming. The focus tonight, possible snow flurries and cold, cold temperatures this weekend. Our Daisy Caballero has the latest projections in our first forecast. Daisy, what a change coming. Right, Laurel, yes, and that's all thanks to some Arctic air that's going to be coming on by within the next day or so really cooling us down and like you said, bringing us some snow flurries currently right now 49 degrees in the Portland metro area. Winds are fairly calm also coming out from the east right around six miles an hour. Again, as we're looking live at our satellite and radar, not a whole ton of activity. We are starting to see some uh, spotty showers, also some mountain snow into those higher elevations, and this is going to continue all the way into tomorrow until we do see a little bit more of that snow. Current temperatures right now 50s over in Forest Grove and Hillsborough, 40s in Boring, Oregon, already seeing those 30s close to below freezing temperatures for John Day over in Burns, Baker City as well. They will probably be getting to below freezing temperatures within the next hour or so. Uh, these are your weather headlines. Again, spotty showers for the rest of tonight into tomorrow. That snow should start to hit the Portland metro area right around 6 o'clock in the evening tomorrow. And we're not expecting a whole ton of snow. Many of us will just see uh, just some light snow. Uh, probably won't see anything more than half of an inch. This is your weekend forecast again, 45 degrees for our high for Saturday. But take a look at this. Lows will be uh, hitting 26 degrees by Sunday. We'll take a look at that hour by hour forecast for that snow and that seven day forecast coming up in just a little bit. Thank you, Daisy. And in anticipation of those frigid temperatures, cold weather shelters are set to open if and when they are needed. Washington County has already said it plans to open a location starting at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. As for Multnomah and Clackamas, that typically happens when temperatures fall below a certain level. In Clackamas, for example, the threshold is 33 degrees. It looks like we're going to be there. Details are up right now on KGW.com. Cold weather or not, life on the streets is a struggle for some people year round. But a new approach to housing in Oregon could bring opportunities, especially to smaller and rural communities. Tim Gordon got a look at some new modular homes that are in development. Tim, there's a lot of interest in these. Yeah, Laurel, there were a lot of people there to see these, including the headliners, Oregon Governor Tina Kotek and U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley, both impressed with the concept and design and the use of Oregon forest products. Inside a warehouse at the Port of Portland's Terminal 2 is the result of six weeks construction work. We can do this and we can do this very, very quickly. Prototype modular homes made in part with Oregon mass timber, a high-tech strong laminate. Thus the name of the project, Mass Casitas. Affordable housing group Hacienda Community Development Corp is leading the project to make this part of the housing crisis solution. These houses will be extremely high quality. Costs will be reasonable. Mass production will reduce that cost even further. Showing off the homes under construction brought out a crowd, including Oregon Governor Tina Kotek and Oregon U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley. They toured the homes that are possible thanks to $5 million in startup money from the Oregon legislature. It's exciting because this is a seed. This is a seed being planted with the vision of growing a whole forest of affordable homes in our state. If the project proves successful, these homes could be mass produced in Oregon with help from a $41 million dollar federal grant to develop and expand Oregon's emerging mass timber industry. And I couldn't be more thrilled 
by these prototypes. And that fits right into the goal from Oregon's new governor to build 36,000 new units of housing in the state annually. We talked to her off podium about yeah, that. You know, what I love about it is it's a homegrown product, mass timber out of, you know, in this case, Southern Oregon, to do modular, which allows us to be more efficient, quicker to put homes on the ground. The governor has other goals for ending homelessness and keeping people housed. Right now. It's more money for outreach, more money for shelters. She just announced specifics of a $130 million plan for that. There is more to come on housing solutions, including these modular homes as a very strong possibility. And these are amazingly designed homes. They are warm, they are friendly, they don't feel like a box. And this is gonna change what we can do in communities around the, around the state. Including in Otis, Oregon, that suffered huge losses from 2020's Echo Mountain fire. Barb and Scott Benedict lost their home and everything else in that fire. They will be gifted one of the casita prototypes being built right now. What's it going to mean for you? Oh, after two and a half years in a 29 foot travel trailer, we're going to have so much room and it's just, it's amazing to us. It's just fantastic. Yeah, good for them. Now, the governor thinks these really could be great for disaster relief and as part of the overall housing solution. No word on what they're going to cost in the end. That will get a little bit later on, like in a year, once they've been tested out in the different climates of Oregon. Laurel David, back to you.